Well, this is a fantastic turnout, and clearly we didn't expect quite this many people, but we are thrilled to have you all here. If we are out of chairs, but if you would like to sit on the floor up here closer to the front, where you can see that is, that is fine, over here on the side as well. We'll leave the aisles open for the Q&A at the end. All right, but again, it's a great turnout. Thank you for coming out tonight. So my name is Jennifer Shettle, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Elementary Education. And um, Dr. Marilyn Parrish, here, thank you, um, and I will be taking on the role of co-chairs for next year's One Book, One Campus Committee. And we are really excited to continue this fantastic tradition of excellence. I want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Caleb Corkery, standing in the back, past chair. <laughs> for organizing this event. He said, you think 200 seats will be enough? I said, oh yeah, absolutely. Don't ask me that. I'm a reading, reading person, not math. So I'm going to get on that for next year. Um, and I'd also like to take, thank the entire One Book Committee. If you're on the One Book Selection Committee, could you kind of just give a little wave, a couple people here from that committee? Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. For picking this really, really awesome book. Um, two things. I want to remind everyone that next Thursday is um, another component of our One Book, One Campus um, event offerings. We're having the Deliberative Dialogue next Thursday in this same room. And also I want to invite you on your way out to stop by the Muslim Student Association's information table in the back and pick up some, some information. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight Mustafa Bayoumi, author of our one book selection, the critically acclaimed nonfiction piece, How Does It Feel to Be a Problem? Professor Bayoumi's writing has appeared in many prominent publications, including the New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, and The Chronicle of Education, to name a few. You can also follow Bayoumi's thoughts and musings on a variety of subjects on his blog. And he currently teaches English at Brooklyn College in New York. I'm also thrilled to have with us tonight Ms. Yasmin Duidar, also known as Yasmin from the Book. Right. Ms. Dwidar is currently employed as a federal court clerk with a focus on public interest law, and she is actively involved in establishing an Arab American Bar Association in New York. Yasmin recently attended her 10th year high school reunion, remember, high school from the book, and she has some interesting stories about how her story in the book has intersected now with her life as a young adult. So please help me welcome to campus Mustafa Bayoumi and Yasmin Dwidar. What's up, Millersville? <laughs> How's it going? How are you? Yeah, everything's good? Good evening. Yeah. Hello. Hello. I am very, very happy to be here, and, and so, I'm so thrilled to see so many of you uh, as well. Um, uh, and I want to offer my great, great thanks to the people who brought me here. That's uh, Dr. Caleb Corkery in particular, the Associate Provost Jeff Adams, the, the One Book Committee, who made a fine choice this year. <laughs> um, and also the people that I've met during my stay here, uh, the, the, the students and faculty members, everybody's been so kind and generous. It's really been a, a, lovely, uh, a lovely event. And I think the only thing that I'm missing so far is a little bit of shoe fly pie. <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, how many of you, I just have a question before I begin. It'll help, me, uh, it'll help me think about how to talk to you about my book. How many of you have read the book? Oh, OK, good. So, so. That's really good, actually. So I'm very happy about that. So let me talk a little bit about the book, why the book came about, where it came from, um, how I went about to, to, uh, uh, to write the book, and maybe offer a few reflections about life uh, after the book itself. So as you know, I stole the title of the book. 
um, uh, you know, a lot of literature is theft. And so this, my theft is uh, from W.E.B. Du Bois, his famous work, The Souls of Black Folk. How many of you have read The Souls of Black Folk before? Oh, no, much far fewer. Ah, okay, that should be, take note, one book committee. Anyways, and um, so The Souls of Black Folk, that's a classic work, though, from, the, from back in the 19, early 1900s, in 1903, where W.E.B. Du Bois writes, about what it's like to be African-American in this really horrible time in uh, American history where there's lynchings around, where there's a very, it's a very polarized culture, it's a very, very violent era in American history. And he's writing this book and he says in the beginning of the book, he says, people are coming up to me all the time and they're asking me, you know, what do you think about this latest outrage that's happening here or there in Mechanicsville or in this place or that place? What do you feel about, what do you think about all of these horrible things that are happening? And he says, sometimes they just come right out and ask me directly. They say, how does it feel to be a problem? To which Du Bois writes, I answer seldom a word. And then he writes a whole book about it. That, right? But there was something about that question that really made that really stuck in my mind. Like I read that book a long time ago, far before 9/11. But there was still something about that question that seemed relevant to my life. Uh, and I think after 9/11, it became even more clear just how how important that question was to ask all over again. Because I think that we have another, in a sense, another set of suspicions that have come and landed in American society. And that's not to say, you know, I think it's very useful to think about the ways in which uh, American society and historically has also tended to other, other groups, make other groups into others and enemies. And that's certainly not unique to American society. It happens in all kinds of different societies. But we are Americans, so we have a responsibility to think about how that happens in the United States. And in the United States, there's a history of that happening, and that history is often connected to the African-American struggle. And in fact, most civil liberty struggles in the United States, post-civil rights era, use the African-American struggle as a model, as a model for how they can think about justice and liberty. And so it was out of that, that desire, I think, that I was borrowing or stealing from W.E.B. Du Bois. That that's why I was thinking about how do, how do I make this connection to this African-American history. It's not to say that what's, that what's happened to the Arab and Muslim communities is in any way the same as what's happened to African-Americans, but it is to say that we can learn something by thinking about how these things repeat themselves and try, trying not to let them repeat themselves. So, in effect, what I really had was the title of my book before I had written anything of my book. Right, which is, I guess, a good way to start writing a book, because you can start from, very, that's from, from the very, very beginning. But I was in New York on 9-11. You know, 12 years ago now, I guess. 12 years in a day. 12 years in a day. I was there. And, uh, you know, I won't forget that day ever, either. I mean, I don't know how many of you uh, remember that day. Many of you seem like you're, you're you know, how old, maybe... 20 years old on average, maybe 19 or so, 19, 20, 21, right? So you were maybe, I guess, eight or nine years old. Do you remember that day? Yeah. So even if you remember at that eight or nine years old, then that must have been it was a very important day in your lives as well. It must have been. And it was a horrible day. It was a horrible day. I remember very clearly just the, the sort of traumas of that whole period, that especially immediately following. I remember, in particular, being in New York City, I remember... You know, the, I remember the long lines at pay phones, for example, because the cell phones stopped working right away. And so suddenly everybody was going to the pay phones and they were putting money in the pay phones and trying to get them to work. I remember immediately the, uh, the grocery stores had lost all of their materials because everybody went in and started buying everything because they closed the tunnels and the bridges in the beginning for a few days. And so suddenly everybody also went out to restaurants to eat because they just didn't want to stay at home and cook and the restaurants were running out of food because they couldn't bring supplies in. It was a very, very interesting time. And everybody became much more communally oriented out of that sensibility, too. There was a wound. There was a giant wound in the skin of a city, and we all had to come together and work towards healing it. There was that sensibility in the very early days. And that wound, what I remember about it in particular, was the smell. You could smell the burning of the buildings for, for weeks, months maybe. And it, was, it was a horrible smell. You could smell it all over the city. It was terrible. And in the very beginning, in the very beginning, the first few weeks, there was actually a lot, of, a lot of compassion and a desire to try to remember what was happening, to know what was happening, to try to move forward, to be constructive, you know, and not to be vengeful. I think there was a real desire on the part of a lot of New Yorkers, and I went to several marches right after 9-11, 
to say, we don't want vengeance out of this. We want something else to come out of it. You know, and I remember also a lot of people going on those marches carrying signs that said things like, you know, Islam is not the enemy, Muslims are our neighbors, and these sorts of things. And that in one way made me feel good, but in another way it sort of made me a little bit more fearful. It's like, well, we're really being like, you know, at the center of it now, too. The community is really being understood as being at the center, and that's, I was waking up to that. <clears throat> That's not to say that there weren't stereotypes about Arabs and Muslims prior to 9-11. There certainly were. But really, something changed after 9-11, I think. I mean, if you asked anybody prior to 9-11 to say something about, you know, and, then, and I think if you asked your average American to talk about Arabs or Muslims, you said, Who, who's a famous Muslim to, to an American prior to 9-11? Chances are they'd probably say Malcolm X. When you say, who's a famous Muslim now to an American, you know, sort of average American, that's a straw man argument, but I'm still using it, that's average American, who's a famous Muslim, and chances are right now, maybe they'll say Osama bin Laden. How terrible is that? But there were, of course there were stereotypes prior to 9-11, but a lot of those stereotypes were really, they thought about Arabs and Muslims as being, I think, living abroad, not living in the United States. And right after 9-11 and since, I think there's been a whole different idea, how do we think about Arabs and Muslims? We think about them as living in the United States, as communities of suspicion, as communities of intrigue, as, as problems to be dealt with. And so that, that's, a, that's a difference. And so I think, and we, I think we've seen that difference grow over the years. And it's something that I think we want to pay attention to. And I think it's a difference that's also made people get, in, in some ways, uh, um, have all kinds of opinions about Arabs and Muslims. And I would say that, you know, that in a lot of ways, Arabs and Muslims, over these last, this last decade, have become progressively dehumanized by the media portrayals and the way in which they're discussed and talked about. Progressively dehumanized. And I was watching this go on. I mean, there was this way in which the, the constant discussion about you know, Arabs and Muslims in the media without really hearing from very many Arabs and Muslims. People were talking a lot about you, but you weren't being actually asked to represent yourself over and over and over again. A lot of policymakers were talking about them. There was, a, there was warfare in the Middle East and all of these sorts of things. And it was, it was really a, a, a very heady time to, to exist. And in fact, you can see that even in the polling data, that the, the, there was a kind of progressive dehumanization because even most Americans, uh, well, a lot of Americans when they were asked in these polls what they think about Islam and Muslims or if they harbor any hostility, many of them would say yes. In fact, back in the early days, around 2001, uh, 2002, the Washington Post did a poll where they were asking that question, do you harbor hostility towards Arabs and Muslims? And the number of the, of the percentage of the American population that said yes was around 39%, according to that poll by the Washington Post. About 39%, which is already a high number, and they're admitting to it, so you would think that it might even be higher than that. But then by the time, that number actually dips for a couple of years because they asked the same question, the same poll, over the years. And then by the time you hit 2010, it's actually hit its stride and it's gone up to almost 50%, to 48%, 48, 49. So it's actually over the years, the hostility levels have increased. They haven't decreased. One would hope that time heals all wounds, but in fact, hostility is gained. It's not diminished in these years. And that includes in the years following my book. And so I was watching a lot of this happening and I was also you know, being familiar with the events that are happening inside of the Arab and Muslim communities. I was also hearing from people firsthand the kinds of stories that they were under, undergoing. And I wasn't seeing that getting represented in the media either. And so I kept on looking and I was thinking about this and I thought we have to see more of these, more of these stories and I still wasn't seeing them. And so at a certain point I just thought, I guess I should just see if I can write a book about them instead. You know, and they often say, if you're ever interested in writing a book, they often say that, you know, you end up writing the book that you want to read. It's the book that you don't find. That's the book that you end up writing. And I think that's, well, that's sort of what happened in my case. And then I, saw, then I thought, okay, well, that's a great idea. Let me write this book. I have a title. So I had the title. And then I thought, I need to also work on some, setting some boundaries. Because for any intellectual project, you need to set boundaries so, to make it legitimate, so, so that you can work on it with responsibility. Right? So what were the boundaries that I decided to set? Well, I thought, I thought it would be interesting to write about young people, especially people in their, in their early 20s, around that age. And I thought that would be inherently interesting because young people are always already trying to figure out where their place is in the world. And it's a difficult stage of life, right? You have, to, you have all kinds of identity issues. You don't exactly know where you're going to be, when the future, where you're going to fit in, etc., etc. It's, it's tough. 
What old people don't tell you is that they, have, they haven't figured it out by the time they've gotten old either, but that's another book, probably. <clears throat> but, um, but can you imagine being a young person and going through all of those questions, and at the same time, then suddenly you have this catastrophic event and you have the hostility of a society coming down on you as well. So I thought that, that would be an inherently interesting kind of question to ask. So I decided to write the book not about everybody, not about even people that from, from all walks of life or from all ages or all geographies. I thought I want to narrow it down as, as best as I could, and to do it as best as I could. And one way of doing that was to talk about that generation that was younger than me. So that was the, the, the people in their early 20s, basically. That was one. Two, I thought it would be very important also to narrow down what I was talking about when I'm talking about Arab or Muslim. So, I'm curious, do people know the difference between Arabs and Muslims, you think? Because I know that sometimes, uh, you know, people um, are not aware of the, of the differences. And it's, to, so in order to tell you what the difference is between, an Arab, between Arabs and Muslims, I have a, I'm afraid I'm going to have to become your high school math teacher for a second. Okay. Do you remember Venn diagrams? <laughs> so, think of Arab and Muslim as two circles. Right? And there's that overlapping part. Right? So some Arabs are Muslim, and some Muslims are Arab. But there are Muslims who are not Arab, and there are Arabs who are not Muslim. Have I confused you yet? No. So, the Arab world, let's talk about international first. Right? So the Arab world is, is a big part of the world, from Morocco all the way to Iraq, and you know, from Syria down to, uh, to Djibouti. Right? It's, uh, it's like 23 different countries. Um, population of the whole Arab world is probably somewhere around 310 million people or so, which is actually roughly the same population as the United States. The Arab world and the United States share roughly the same amount of population, even though there's a lot more countries in one, one only one country in the other. Of those people in the Arab world, that's the region of the world, too, where you get the Abrahamic tradition. You get really old religions there. You have, you have Judaism, you got Christianity, and a little bit later you got Islam coming, right? And you got all these, you got a lot of other religions, too. So this is a very, very complex area with lots and lots and lots of history. Now, in the Arab world today, most of the people in the Arab world, but by all means not all of them, most of the people are Muslim. Maybe 80% or so, you could say. 80, 85% are Muslim. The rest are minorities of various other sorts. They might be Christians, Arab Christians. They might be Arab Jews. They might be these religions you've never heard of, like Mandians and Sabians or things like that. Or there could be atheists. They could be, have no religion. Right? See, there's a lot of religious complexity in that region. But that's so 80% of 300 million. See, I'm, I told you I was going to be your high school math teacher. Yeah. What's 80% of 300 million? It's like only like 240 million. How would I do? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so if that's the case, how many Muslims are there in the whole world? Like 1.5 billion, something to that effect. So the number of Muslims in the world is much, much larger than the number of Arabs, Arab Muslims. In fact, what's the large, the most populous Arab? Uh, excuse me. Now I just made a mistake. What's the most populous Muslim country in the world? Anybody know? Indonesia. Indonesia. Very good. Good. Right. Indonesia. After Indonesia, it might be Pakistan, and then maybe India. With a lot of people in India, Muslims are a minority in India, but when you have a lot of people, that even a minority is a big number. <laughs> right. And then there's various countries after that. An Arab country doesn't show up until far down the list in the for the number of people who are Muslim in the world. So you see the difference between Muslim and Arab. And one way to think about it is Muslim is a religion, Arab is like an ethnicity. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about it. Right? It's Muslim is the, a Muslim is just somebody, a person who practices Islam. Muslim is the nominative form. It's, the, it's a grammatical term. Muslim is like the person of who is the practitioner practitioner of Islam. Right? And so. So that's, that's the difference out in the outside world, outside world there, right? Now, in the United States, just because I have to make it even more complicated, right, it's the other way around. So there are Arabs in the United States, but most Arabs in the United States are Christian, are not Muslim. Most Arabs in the United States, are probably three-quarters of the Arabs in the United States are Christian. Only a quarter or so are Muslim. And that has to do with a lot with immigration histories. So the Arab migration, for all kinds of reasons, was coming primarily first in the late 19th century from the Mount Lebanon area. Many were Christian villages that picked up and moved over here, and then they, they had children, etc., etc. 
And then, you know, in the 1920s, in the United States, the doors of immigration basically closed, especially if you were coming from a non-European part of the world, right? So when those doors of immigration closed, then that meant that there weren't new people coming in. And in fact, what that meant was, even though there were still people coming out from the Arab world and trying to get into the new world, they would come to the United States and knock on the door, but the door was closed. You know, Lady Liberty's torch was out, I guess. And then, uh, and then they just found their, they kept on going. And they, in fact, that's why you have large Arab populations, Arab Christian populations in South America. You have large Arab populations in Venezuela. You have large Arab populations in Brazil. Brazil has like 10 million Arab pe people of Arab descent. You ever, in, if you know any Brazilians, ask them about kibbe, which is a Lebanese dish, and they'll, they consider it part of the Brazilian cuisine. You ever heard of like um, um, Shakira, for example? You heard of Shakira? Do you, do you know Shakira has a last name? She's not like Cher. She actually has a last name. <laughs> do you know what Shakira's last name is? <laughs> Mubarak. No relation to the ex-dictator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's Shakira Mubarak. She's Lebanese, actually. Her family's Lebanese descent. And that's all part of that history. In fact, you know, one of the things when I was talking to a lot of the people, the young people that I was talking to to write my book, a lot of them, in the, especially in the first six months or so after 9-11, or first year or so, the young people, they were going to high school and they were like thinking, well, maybe we shouldn't, you know, maybe I shouldn't be so easily identifiable as like, you know, as uh, Arab or as, it, it, you know, this is mostly in the Arab communities and so they were like, maybe I shouldn't be so easily identifiable as Arab. So a lot of them would say, you know, you know, one of my friends, this is how he told me, he said, yeah, a lot of the Arab kids in my high school, he's a, he's a Yemeni kid, he goes, a lot of the Arab kids in my high school, after 9-11, they, they pretended that they were from South America. And he says, the Palestinians were even more specific. They said they're Venezuelan. <laughs> right? and, but they could say they're Venezuelan because there's actually a, a Palestinian population in Venezuela. So it's, that part of, it's also part of this larger immigration history. And so these immigration histories are, are very interesting, if you ask me. And, um, and they end up reflecting international migration routes and globalization, global patterns, as well as a lot of things about how we deal with complexity and difference in our own society. So I thought, okay, I want to I want to write about Arab Muslims in the United States primarily. So there is one story that's from, with, about an Arab Christian in the book. Do you remember which one that is? This is a test. So. Sammy, yes. And uh, and then um, and to give you some sense too, the Arab, the Arab, the uh, Muslim American population in the United States is the most religiously diverse population in the United States. Period. It comes from 69 different nationalities. Right? Because it's really, Islam is this big global religion, and so you get all of these different people coming from all different parts of the world and, and, uh, and um, practicing the faith. So it's very hard to talk about that. There's a whole, all kinds of different moments of arrival and departure and like all different kinds of histories, including African history and African American history. And, I mean, I remember I was reading once, well, a long time ago, I was reading a book by this historian named Peter Wood, and he was talking about colonial South Carolina. And he says, you know, he's looking through the records of colonial South Carolina. The book is called Black Majority because there were more people of African descent, more Africans and people of African descent because of the slave trade there than white people back in the day. And he said, he's, in one of the lines in that book, and I'm not, I'm quoting directly, he said, Mustafa was a fairly common name in South Carolina, colonial South Carolina. I read that and I thought, that's my name. <laughs> right? Because, and that was, those were people of, those were Africans who were Muslim, who had come over to the United States and through slavery. You know, there's a sizable part of American history that's about Muslims in the slave trade and after. There were, there, were a number, there were a number of Muslims, uh, African Muslims who were enslaved in the United States, which is another really rich and complicated and interesting history. But, so if you want to talk about Islam, then suddenly, in the United States, suddenly it becomes such a big project. So I thought, much better for me to be narrower in my focus. I can do that more responsibly. So that's why I decided to focus primarily on Arab Muslim. With Sammy. God bless Sammy. Right? And, um... Uh, so I knew that I wanted to write about young people, Arabs, I had a title, I'm getting towards the, you know, the concept of the book. The last thing I needed was a setting. And I thought, okay, I'm going to choose Brooklyn. Why, do I, why did I choose Brooklyn? Because A, because I live in Brooklyn. So I didn't have to travel for my research, it's easier that way. But that's not really the main reason. B, Brooklyn is living, Brooklyn is essentially in the shadows of the, the, the towers that fell. Right? So it has a, a kind of intimacy and complexity of that geography. So that's, there's that reason. Three, 
in 2010, you know, the Census Bureau, for, I'm sorry, in 2000, the year 2000, the Census Bureau asked in the long form about Arab ethnicity. So we actually have an official count for the number of people of Arab descent in the United States. And in that, what that showed in that official account was that the city that had the highest number of Arab Americans in the country was New York City. And within New York, the borough that had the highest number was Brooklyn. Now, that's not the same as concentration. Because if you go to Dearborn, Michigan, which is a smaller place, the number of Arabs in Dearborn is about a third of the population. Right? So it's a very high concentration. But in Brooklyn, there's certainly not a third of Brooklyn. The number of Arabs in Brooklyn is quite small, relatively speaking. But, um, but it's still the largest number because there's so many people in Brooklyn. You see what I'm saying? This is like a math lecture. It's turning into a math lecture, isn't it? And then, um, so there was that reason. So the, the numbers are high in Brooklyn. And then also because Brooklyn is, in a way, it doesn't, it doesn't belong to anybody. Brooklyn is very multicultural. It's very complex. It's like nobody really owns Brooklyn. It's, Brooklyn has its own history, its own sentiment, its own, its own identity, you know. Brooklyn, it, it's, it's almost like the future of the United States because the future of the United States is going to become just as complex as, as, you know, I think, as Brooklyn is today in terms of its identity and its, and its uh, diversity and all of these sorts of things. You know, Brooklyn, in a, in a lot of ways, Brooklyn is like, you know, it's like the best parts of the United States. Uh, it's like the United States is like its foreign policy, you could say, right? <laughs> Brooklyn is like, Brooklyn is like, you know, and nobody, you know, Brooklyn is the future in a certain sort of, sort of ways. And, you know, unless, unless you consider, you know, Queens a rival, which we can't do because we're coming out of Brooklyn. Okay. So, um, so I had all of these ideas that I was going to write about, and I wrote about Brooklyn, and I have a little description of Brooklyn in the book that you might recall. And, um, and then I decided also that I wanted to try to find the right stories to write about, and I knew I was going to write these long chapters, long, rich chapters. Because I thought, what better way to approach this idea of progressive dehumanization than by, in a sense, rehumanizing the population through the act of storytelling. Because I believe that there's something in the act of storytelling, if it's really done well, I'm not saying I did it well, but in general, if it's done well, the act of storytelling, what it does is it means that you actually relinquish who you are while you're reading, for, that moment, for those moments while you're reading, and you inhabit the life of someone else. You know when you're reading a, a really good novel and you're on the subway, or like, maybe not the subway, but... But you know what I'm talking about. And like you just forget where you are for a moment and you miss your station or whatever it is, right? Your class. Because you're reading your novel and it's so gripping. Because it means that you've entered the life of someone else for that moment. That, that transom of identity has been, has, there's, a, there's a bridge over it. I think that's something that's so important for our future. To be able to understand somebody else's life from the inside. That's what, in fact, literary theorists write about this. Jean-Paul Sartre writes about this in his book, Why Write? Right? In, in his theory of literature. Uh, and, and I think that this is true. And so I knew that I wanted those kinds of stories where if I'm telling a story the right way, in the rich enough way, then maybe it'll have some power of rehumanizing a population that's been dehumanized. So I knew I had to find the right kind of stories, rich stories that I could tell over the span of time that could tell about really interesting people. So I went looking for those stories. How did I go looking for the stories? Well, I talked to a lot of different people. I talked to my friends and asked them to talk to their friends and talk to their friends, etc., etc., etc. That's one way of doing it. You know, and then, and word was slowly getting out. You know, one day I got a phone call at home and I picked up the phone and somebody said, hey, hey you're the guy writing the book? And I said, yeah. He goes, oh, okay, well, this happened to me on Thursday. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, well, that's terrible what happened to you on Thursday, but... Um, I'm not really writing a book about Thursdays, so, I mean, it was bad, but it was only one incident, and so I wanted things that could, I could hang a whole chapter on. But it was, a good, it was a good sense, because that meant that the word was getting out for the book, right? And then I also went to community organizations, I went to mosques, I, I talked to lawyers, I talked to uh, all different kinds of people who do a kind of community-level work in the communities. And I was always a little bit nervous when I was doing this in the very beginning. Because I live in, you know, I'm an Arab, I'm Muslim, but I, I wasn't born there in New York City or in Brooklyn. I came to, as a graduate student, and then I, I lived by, you know, I went to Columbia, so I was living up by Columbia, and then I would move eventually to Brooklyn, but that was later on, and then I was living in a different part of Brooklyn than where that center of the Arab community is. And at the same time, when I started writing my book, was when there was one of these high-profile terrorism cases going on, and they had sent 
an, a police undercover police informant into the community, and he had and that had really broken down a lot of the trust between people in the community, and they were afraid to talk to strangers, or they didn't want to take the risk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I was always thinking, oh, you know, are they gonna are they gonna believe me? I mean, really, I'm I don't I come with no agenda, but are they gonna think that I'm you know working for the man at the same time? So I, whenever I would go meet with the, the, a new imam or a new community leader, I would always bring a stack of my articles that I'd written, previously written to show them, say, hey, look, I'm a good guy and everything. I was always a little bit nervous. And then I, I remember one day I went to one of the Friday, I went to Friday prayer at one of these mosques, and, uh, and the imam is a very influential guy and a very nice guy. And so after the prayer was over, then he sees me in the congregation, and he's like, oh, Mustafa, I want to talk to you. Uh, can you wait for me up in my office? And so I said, uh, oh, okay, so fine. So I go up to his office, and I'm waiting. And... Um, and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be really, either really good or really bad. Because he's either going to tell me a really good story, or he's going to tell me to get lost because he doesn't trust me. So I'm just like waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally he comes in, and he walks right past me, sits down at his desk, opens the drawer, pulls out a little book, starts flipping through the pages, and he says, ah, yes, here it is. Um, she's 31. She has a master's degree in chemistry from Denmark. She's Egyptian. She lives in New Jersey. Do you want to meet her? <laughs> He's trying to set me up, so I said, "Thank you, Imam." I said, "No." He goes, "Hey, hey, Mustafa. Hey, how is Hey, Abbasusa." I said, "Why not, Mustafa? She's beautiful, like sweet honey cake." He said, "No, thank you." But uh, but I thought also that was a good sign because then they were, you know, obviously they thought that I was trustworthy enough to marry somebody who's like you know part of the community. And then third, you know, then a little, not too long after that, one of the community leaders invited me, actually, um, <clears throat> he came up to me, late, he called me up on the phone, I think, and he said, uh, Mustafa, I said, yeah, he said, um, the FBI called. I said, oh, you know, if you're a you know, journalist, then that's, a, that's a, actually a good thing, but usually that's a bad thing to hear, right? And so, so the FBI called, I said, yeah, and he goes, yeah, they want to meet with us, just a closed door meeting. Like no press, no no community members, just the the leaders of the community. They want to have a meeting. I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. He said, do you want to come? I said, yeah, yeah, I want to come. He goes, okay. So he told me where I was. He picked me up. We drove there. So it was held in the in the Muslim Youth Center down on Bath Avenue in Brooklyn. So it's like this old converted Italian like banquet hall with like this huge chandelier that's like almost kissing the ground, you know, and like mirrors on the walls and everything. And now it's like all just, you know, a big empty space of rug where people pray and like, you know, and have judo lessons upstairs and that kind of thing, right? And, uh, and so we get there, we park, and then we go into the, to the center. And while we're there, there's like this, it's like a stream of, of police walking through. First, it's all NYPD with all of their flak jackets and everything, and they're just combing through the building. And then they walk out. And then it's a stream of like the same police, but with the community affairs, like windbreakers. They don't wear flat jackets, they wear windbreakers, because I guess they're like the, the kind police or something. I don't know. <laughs> and then, so they, they walk through, and then they leave. And then the FBI comes in. And later on, I learned why, because the, the guy who was heading the meeting was this guy named Mark Marchand, who at that time was the head of counterterrorism in New York for the FBI. So he was like a big, he's like the big shot guy, right? So that, and then we go in, and so then the FBI guys come in. There's like, there's like, you know, eight or nine, forget exactly how many, so eight or nine or ten of, of them. And then there's us. And I, I got, I mean, I have to tell you, I mean, I never met FBI before. And they look exactly like they do in the movies. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, they're all like... Huge guys with like buzz cuts and blue suits, except there was one Moroccan agent with them who had a brown suit. <laughs> really? I don't know why he had to wear the brown suit, but he was wearing a brown suit. The rest of them were wearing blue suits. And they all like they shook your hand with like a really, really tight grip and they repeated your name. It was like, hi Mustafa. And I'm like, you're like, hi. <laughs> and it was just like, you know. And then so we do the like the hellos, whatever, and then everybody sits down. And then there's a big square. I guess people thought the meeting, meet, the meeting would be a little bit bigger than it, uh, than it turned out to be. So there's about you know, 10 of them and 12 of us kind of thing, and there, there was a big square made up of tables. So we all sat on different sides, and it's so, actually we were quite far away from them. Right? And the meeting hadn't formally begun yet, but so they all sit down, and then the Muslim community leaders sit down. And then, um, so in the, um, this is the Arab Muslim American Federation, so they're all Arabic speaking and they're Muslims. And so they're speaking to each other in Arabic, and they say to each other, 
Why are they so far away? I don't know. Why are they so far away? They shouldn't be so far away. No, we should move the tables closer together. It'll make for a better meeting. Yeah, okay, let's move the tables closer together. So, so they say all this to them, you know, to each other. But of course, the FBI guys, except maybe the Moroccan guys, they don't know what they're saying. And so at a certain point, all of them, all of the Arab men just all stand up at the same time and move all the tables towards the uh, FBI guys. And the FBI guys have this look of like, what's going on? And then everybody sits down, you know, we do all, everybody does the introductions, Mark Marchand leads the meeting, and he starts off, you know, by saying, well, we've been talking to the Bangladeshi Muslim American community, we've been talking to the Pakistani American, the Muslim American community, and now we want to talk to the Arab Muslim American community. And so you sort of see like this bureaucratic mapping division of the, of the city too. And he says, and you know, what we want to do, you know, just back up a little bit too, I should tell you too, this is the Federation, so the people who, are, who he's talking to are essentially all, like, they're the community leaders. And most of them have been there for a generation, they've succeeded in the United States, they are, they're mostly doctors or lawyers or um, small business owners. You know, they're, they're the, the, the middle class backbone of the United States in a lot of ways, like a lot of immigrant communities. So he says to them, Mark Marchand begins and he says, you know, what we want to do is we want to instill in the Arab American Muslim community that same sense of love and respect for American values that we all have. It's a little condescending, don't you think? I mean, these guys are already part of the fabric of the United States. They've already contributed to that. It's as if they was, he was questioning their their participation in it from the beginning. And so then, you know, they go off and they start asking all these, they start asking questions like, you know, what would you do if, if um, somebody came to the, to the community and said that they wanted to perform a terrorist act? What would you do? What would you do? And so it's like this, this, the whole meeting was this weird, from the FBI side, this weird meeting and accusation to me, it seemed, it seemed like. You know, and then there was, you know, there was an imam with us who was looking very much like any imam. You know, an imam is a religious leader, and he had like, you know, the the galabeya on and like the kufi, and he was like, they asked him, and he gave this very roundabout religious answer, the way that people who are, you know, religious talk in these like, very flowery terms, and I think that was confusing to them, and it was just, you know, it 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 just was a bad, it was a bad meeting. It felt like there was there were two different populations really talking at odds with each other. Like another, at another level too, then the community said, well, you know, we have issues too. And they said, okay, well, let's hear your issues. And they're like, well, we need to get off the no-fly list, for example. Like we have many members in our community have, are on the no-fly list. And if you know anything about Arab names, you know, Arabic culture is a very rich and a, a deep, long historical culture. But there are, uh, a, you know, not when it comes to names. <laughs> the names repeat over and over and over and over again. You will have a million like Mustafa Ahmeds and mi another million Ahmed Mustafas in the, in one city, right? And uh, and so it's easy to get people confused because of their names in the Arab culture, and so uh, so that happens to a lot of people in the community. And so they need to then get off the no-fly list because for some reason they're on this no-fly list. You know the no-fly list has grown to like half a million names. In fact, at one point Ted Kennedy, the former senator, Ted, uh, he's deceased now, but Ted Kennedy was on the no-fly list as well because I guess that one Ted Kennedy somewhere was, was suspected of something or something. So it was very confusing and how to get off the no-fly list. So their advice, after the community was telling them that we need, we need help with the no-fly list, their advice, and I'm, I'm telling you directly, their advice was, yes, we know the system is broken. All I can tell you is try to get to the airport early. Seriously. And then, you know, the community is saying, well, we have issues with, uh, with, with charitable giving. We need to find out a way that we can give money because charity is a big part of their religion, too. And if they're, if they're being um, suspected every time they give money, then that's a big issue. And so there are all these ways, these very specific ways that the government policies have actually limited the opportunities for Muslims to, act, to practice their religion in full in the United States in post 9-11. <clears throat> and so, so, uh, uh, but three quarters of the way into the meeting, and the meeting is going on and on and on, it's really, really taking far too long, probably like I'm doing right now. And, uh, and then at a certain point, you know, one of the guys, one of the Muslim leaders whispers in the ear of the other, and he goes off somewhere to the store and comes back within like five minutes. And he have, comes back with paper plates, um, orange soda, and Cheetos. 
Because, you know, even if it's the FBI, you still have to be hospitable. <laughs> right? So now everybody gets like their soda and their, and their Cheetos and Burgers. The meeting is continuing and there's this little tension in the air and it's a very strange meeting. And then one of the FBI guys starts talking and he's like, well, we're investigating the Muslim community. I'm using the same ideas that we were investigating at Cosa Nostra, the, the mob. That's what he told us. That's what he told us. And actually, a lot of the stuff that was said at that meeting has <coughs> proven to be yeah, very accurate. But I didn't realize it at the time. He said, we're, we're investigating with the mob. And then I'm looking at him, and here he is, this big guy, and he's barely balancing a plate of, like, orange Cheetos uh, and sipping orange soda. His fingers are, like, orangey, you know. And I'm thinking, man, you probably wish we were the mob, because then at least you'd have, like, a Chianti and a Ville Marsala or something. <laughs> Anyway, so the meeting was a bit of a bust, right? but it gave me good material, and so uh, it was good for that. But it did show to me that, you know, that there's all of these ways in which the communication, levels of communication, even the basic understanding of why people want to communicate is broken. It's broken on a lot of different levels. And, uh, and can easily be manipulated, I think, also for, for nefarious purposes, and I think we can see that um, in, in, in what's happened afterwards, especially when we think about the the, the most recent revelations uh, concerning this issue come out of the New York City Police Department. For the last two years, the Associated Press has been writing a series of reports that they, because they're getting these things leaked out to them from the Police Department, that the New York City Police Department has been spying on the Arab, um, on the Muslim community in New York City without any cause. And they have a whole unit of the de police department called the Demographics Unit, or was called the Demographics Unit, that was sent out just to spy on the community and to look for whatever they could to make all these catalogs about what people were eating on any given day, where they would go to shop, where they would get their hair cut. I mean, I'm not making any of this up. You can look at, find it all on the web. Um, and um, in the AP, you go to AP and you'll find it. And, um, um, and they, not for any reason, in fact, later on, because when the story came out, it became a controversy that, they, that there's a lawsuit that has been filed, and they filed a, they, so they had to have a deposition with Thomas Galati, who was one of the chief police officers involved in all of this. And they've been doing this for years, years and years and years. And Thomas Galati then said well, that, that, in fact, there have been no leads that has been developed out of this program. No leads whatsoever. No leads. And what they have done, though, is they've sent out informers into the community, and there was, some of the informers are now speaking to the media, and the informers were told by their handlers that they should, um, that they should what's called create and capture. That they should create a scenario where they could then capture somebody. So it's, they're setting people up at the same time. Right? And so these are, these are worrisome, these are really worrisome, worrisome terms, I think, for a, a free society. They're worrisome terms for a free society. You know, and one of the other things that they were doing, because they were told, told to go to all the different restaurants and things like that, and this is actually also uh, in the documents. But what was interesting was that some of the, they would, the, their supervisors found that they were going to these restaurants, some specific restaurants, the, the undercovers who were told to go to these areas and make all these notes, were going to some specific restaurants over and over and over again, and some specific bakeries over and over and over again. Even though these restaurants and bakeries had been long ago cleared of any suspicion and were like, you know, had, there was no more documentation to be had about them. So the supervisors went to them and said, why do you keep going to these places? And you know why they were going there? The food. They liked the food. Yes, they wanted the more of the food. And then they would bill the New York City Police Department for the food. I swear, I swear, it's, in the, it's all in the documents. But more, more troubling than that, more troubling than that, I think, is, is really this idea that, um, that we as a society give up our privacy to the government and let the government function in private. Because that's the way that things are headed if they aren't there already. If, you haven't, if you're not following what I'm talking about, then you, can, you might probably know about what's happening with all these NSA revelations as well. And there are many other examples in our post-9-11 world where what, what you have is, in fact, I think it's a flip, it's a dangerous flip of the social contract that we as a society are engaged in. That contract says that we as a society, our social, we as members of a society, have the right to have a private life. 
But you as a government do not have the right to be private. You're supposed to be public because you work for us. You have to be, we have to be able to hold you accountable. We have to be able to hold you accountable. We have privacy and you have public, you work in the, in the open, openness. And now that's changed around. It's changed around fundamentally in these days for the Muslim community in the United States. But it doesn't, it doesn't and, it, and it probably won't stop there. So I think it's a, con it's a concern for all of us as well. So that's one. And on the other, the, another way of putting that same thing, that same issue, is in a free and open society, right, people should not be afraid of their government. Government should be afraid of the people. People should not be afraid of the government. The government should be afraid of the people. But if the government is allowed to operate in secrecy and you have, are, are not allowed to have any privacy, then again, that, that equation is turned, over, turned around. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous for a democracy. It's dangerous. And so I think that it's really important that we think about, you know, what's happened in these, in the lives of the Arab and Muslim community in the United States. We think about the consequences of our, our society. We think about how to prevent a catastrophe like 9-11 from ever happening again. It's a horrible crime. Absolutely terrible terrorist act. And how we can prevent that again. But how are we going to do that without throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Right? Without destroying our society at the same time. And I think another way of thinking about that that connects to the ethos of my book is that we have to really be in charge of our own narrative. Because if you don't have any public, if you don't have any privacy, but the government has privacy, then you're actually giving them the right to write your story. You're giving them the right to write your story. The NYPD is trying to write the story of Muslim Americans. And they're getting it wrong a lot of the times. When they're writing all those reports too, they're identifying people wrongly all over the place. Now people have seen some of these reports because the AP is letting them out. They're identifying certain places as being a Shia or when they're Sunni. They're identifying places as being Lebanese when they're um, uh, Syrian. They're identifying some places as being Jewish when they're Christian, etc., etc. This is true. Don't let anybody else write your story. Individually, or as a community, or as a nation. You have to write your own story and be in charge of your narrative. That's the most important thing, I think. To know who you are by writing your own story and being in charge of your narrative. And then, you and somebody else can share your story. And maybe that other person will let you write his or her story and you do the same. If it's a, if it's a system of equality, there's a great deal to be learned if you also want to share your story with someone else. Because that's how a society is actually built. You know, one of the things, the, the thing that is the most dear to me about writing this book, most dear to me, is the friendships that I've made with people like Yasmin, the people that I've written about. You know, and the, the idea that they would give me the trust to write about their lives has made me a richer person. Because I know who they are, like, to some degree, right? And I think Yasmin understands me, or the others, by the way that I've written their story, and I would love it if they would write my story as well. So being, taking charge of narrative and not letting anybody abuse your narrative, I think is at the essence of what uh, I'm trying to do. And I think, I think, personally, that it's a very important lesson to hold for the future of our democracy. Thank you very much. So it's a good question. Did everybody hear the question? It's like, what can Muslims, right? What can Muslims in America do to help um, um, you know, uh, uh, 
disabuse the power of the, the hate mongers in a way to like to try to get a better better narrative of what Muslim American life is about. What can your average ordinary Muslim do? Right. So I think well I think that there are many things. There was a study that was done in Time Magazine it was, that was commissioned by Time Magazine that came out in 2010 that said something if I remember correctly it said that 62%. 62%, that's almost two-thirds. 62% of the American public had never even met a Muslim person. Right? Probably true, right? I mean, I don't know, I'm not sure, but it seems to me from a very, very brief encounter with this part of uh, the country that there's probably not a large Muslim population in, in this part of the country, right? Uh, and that might be representative of much of the country. So that, I think, I think that that's a really important number. It's a really important statistic, because what that means is that most Americans in a post-9-11 environment have an opinion about Islam and Muslims. Almost every American, I bet you, has some kind of opinion. But where is that opinion coming from? It has to be coming then out of media or television shows or the news media, uh, cable TV, you know, like, you know, a lot of places that, that present very sensationalized, often very noxious views. So there's, I think there's a responsibility that Muslims have to engage their non-Muslim, you know, neighbors, their not the non-Muslims around them too. I think that is a responsibility that the Muslim community should take. That's one. And many of them are. I'm not saying that they don't, but I do think that that is a responsibility. The second thing I think is that there's a problem in both the Arab and Muslim communities, and in generally from people who come from the third world to the United States. In my opinion, and that problem is that we've tended to favor the professions. Um, over others, certain professions over others, especially the sciences like the, you know, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a lawyer, you have, no offense, you have to be, you have to be a successful businessman or a woman, right? And, and, and devaluing the arts, the humanities, journalism, performance, poetry, I mean, poetry is at the heart of, you know, Arab and Muslim culture. The Quran is written out of a poetic sensibility. And yet, you know, you try telling any, any uh, Arab, Arab or Muslim, you know, mother or father, hey, Dad, I'm going to be a poet. You see what happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so I, but I do think it's actually very important that there's more representation of people of variety of backgrounds, and I'm not even talk, just talking about Muslim or Arab, but in, in being able to penetrate into the different representational spheres of the society. And that includes in Hollywood and in television shows. You know, TV shows still tend to have a very, they still tend, they're getting better. They are getting better, but they still tend to draw from a relatively narrow segment of the American population. And that's true not just for the people who are on screen, but also the people who are doing the writing and the producing and that sort of thing. So we need more people in those fields as well. Okay, so I'm going to have to disagree about the lawyer thing. Um, because, so for example, in the story, it discusses um, how my father didn't want me to, um, it, it doesn't necessarily talk about him not wanting me to go into the law, but he wanted me to go into medicine. And um, I actually do not think that a lot of Arab Muslim families have actually encouraged their children to go um, into the legal profession. Um, so Mustafa listed a bunch of professions that I think people need to be going into, but um, I would probably add to that, for example, education um, and politics um, and the law, because I, I honestly don't think that there are enough people that are in the legal field, and I know this from being in law school, there are probably two other people that were, two or three other people that were Arab and happened to be Muslim um, in my law school class of like 120, um, and my school was a, a liberal school that was very diverse, and so if we went to other campuses, the story might actually be different. Um, I don't see a lot of um, Arabs or Muslims participating um, in politics either. Um, and I think that that's a shame because it, there needs to be some sort of representation for our communities in politics and that just doesn't exist and that's because people aren't moving in that direction. And so my hope would be that you know people from our generation are open to that because there's a lot of change that you can make. Um, in the legal field and in politics. And I was just talking to someone earlier about the impact of education. Because when you're teaching people, you, you, you bring a certain perspective with you. And if there aren't enough diverse people who are teaching about, you know, uh, teaching with diverse perspectives, then how do we expect uh, our children to learn about different communities, including the Arab and Muslim communities? Um, but 
I have to say that I understand where you're coming from because I'm frustrated and I, I feel suffocated a lot of the time because the media is very powerful. Um, and as one person, you feel like you can't counter all of that. I can't counter, you know, that every single day the media is telling everybody, you know, um, Muslims and Arabs are terrorists. Granted, you know, Muslims and Arabs are separate. They're pretty much grouped um, together and they're labeled as terrorists. They do, you know, women are oppressed. They're terrorists. This happened. So there's a lot of negativity in the media and it's really difficult to counter. Um, one of the things that I actually like to use and um, it, it's not um, as obvious that it's making an impact, but I know that it does to an extent um, because I'll get private messages. And so social media is actually a way to spread information. Um, so what you see on TV, you know, it's what, whatever the media is feeding to you, but I also feel like on things like Facebook and Twitter, for instance, there's a, a lot more of a diversity of perspective. And so I'll read and learn about things that I would never read on my own. And I end up sharing a lot of um, news stories or I'll share my opinion on a lot of things. And people have actually written to me directly thanking me for the things that I'm posting, saying, you know, I never would have known about XYZ if you didn't post this. I wouldn't have known about ABC if you didn't post this. And so I think social media is one of those ways to kind of, you know, introduce um, a diversity of perspective and allow people to, to learn about, you know, other things, not just, you know, Arabs and Muslims, but various topics that people might not pay attention to. Um, and lastly, I have to say, you know, I've, I've, I've told my friends, you know, I don't feel like I can counter um, how the media portrays Arabs and Muslims, and it's, it's really difficult to be both Arab and Muslim and female, you know, um, at the same time. Um, and I remember talking to one friend, and I said, I, I don't feel that I have the energy. I'm trying really, really hard um, to educate people, um, and I don't know if I'm making enough of a difference. Um, and he actually turned to me and he said, I don't think you need to change anything because just by being friends with you, you have taught me so much um, and you've really changed my perspective on things. And so I think, you know, just trying to be the best person that you can be and being who you are sometimes is the best way to allow people to see what maybe Arabs and Muslims are like. When, when people have no exposure to people from our community, you know, their only information is what they get from the media, but when they end up meeting people like me or meeting people like you, then they realize, you know what, these people share a lot in, in common with us and they're not those crazy people that are being um, portrayed on TV. And so, you know, those are one of the many ways that um, you, can, you can try to educate others or just to, you know, be a good example that people can learn from. So in other words, we should all become friends with the SME. Everything will be fine. <laughs> Uh, next question. Yeah, in the back. Hi, um, my question is, based on current events, such as the situation in Syria, and your own work where in the book, what are your thoughts on the future of Muslim and Arab community? In the United States? In the United States. <laughs> so I, I actually asked that as a qualifier in the United States, um, because you know, one of the things I think that's really important to also to um, think about is that in the in the I'm an academic, which means that I take really I take the long way to get to an to answer a question. So, um, anyways, so one of the things I think that's really useful to think about is traditionally in the United States, I think when we think about race relations, I think we tend to think about race relations as being very connected to domestic policy, very connected to domestic policy. Now, race relations have often had a foreign policy component to them, but we tend to think of them. Our imagination about race relations is really about, this is about the domestic sphere of the country. Now, I think what's different when you're thinking about how the relations will be with Arabs and Muslims in the future of this country, something is a little bit different, because whatever happens in that part of the world over there has a lot of influence and impact on what happens in the Arab American community here. And Americans generally feel like they can change foreign policy much less, and that's true, than they can change domestic policy, generally speaking, I think. So, um, so it's really hard to, in some ways to predict what the future will be, because the future is actually very contingent on what the foreign policy you know, approaches and objectives are 
of the United States and what happens in generally in that in the region, in the Middle Eastern region of, of the world. Now, thinking about that, you know, on the whole, one cannot be that optimistic these days. This is uh, we are going through a very very difficult time, and it's even made more difficult because merely two years ago we were full of euphoria, you know, uh, with the Arab Spring beginning, and now it looks like the whole region is in, is you know it's like a swamp in a way of, of conflict, and so um, uh, that 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 makes it all the more imperative, you know, that to understand that if you work for peace internationally then you're actually also working for justice locally. I think, I think that's, that maybe that's been true in all kinds of ways in American history, but it's really true when it comes to the present of, of Arab Muslim communities in this country and, and the future of the United States as a whole. Thank you. I've been really lucky. I've traveled like 
across the world. I've been to the Middle East to lecture about my book. I've been to Europe to lecture about my book. Um, I taught for six months in South Korea. That was, I'm sure enabled uh, by my book. Um, so selfishly, it's been that's been good. But it, I didn't write it selfishly. I mean, I hope you believe me. Um, but um, I wrote it uh, because I felt that there was a reason to write it. And I think that what it did teach me, because I was very, um, you know, uh, the f let, let me put it this way, the form of the book is one that is um, perhaps not entirely unique, but it's not typical. I don't think it's typical, you know, for the kind of journalism that, or the kind of writing. It's somewhere in between, I, I call it literary journalism, it's like nonfiction narrative. People do it in their own sort of ways, but it's not, it's not a huge segment of the market, and I had never done any sustained work in this area before. I'd done a couple of articles that were similar to it as a, as a test to myself to see if I could write in that way. And so writing the book also enabled me, or proved to me, and this will make sense in a second, but it proved to me that I can listen. Because, you know, listening is, a, is the most important act. Speaking, who cares? Like, you know, everybody can speak, but not everybody can listen. So in other words, it's far more important what you're doing right now than what I'm doing right now. And, um, and to write a book like this is actually, the, that's, the, that's the main requirement, is you have to be able really to listen to what people are telling you. Because we don't always hear what people are telling us. It took me a while to learn that, and to learn how to listen, to hear, to try to hear what somebody is telling you. And I think that's an important lesson that I learned. Thank you for being here, and I wanted to address a question I had for you. Are you concerned about the dangers of a different sort of problem, uh, one in which maybe we do reach a, a time in our society, American society, where uh, the popular uh, opinion sways and trends towards a, a lot of tolerance and acceptance, and maybe we're getting you know, close to that in some regards now, but one in which it presents a different sort of problem, and that problem might be uh, maybe a sort of exoticism or superficial tolerance versus a deep discourse. And then how do we know, how do we know where we are as a society if we're reflecting on, are we actually involved in dialogue that's deep and meaningful versus the superficial? And maybe we need the superficial to get deep. I don't know. Thoughts? Um, yeah, I contributed to a volume uh, an academic volume several years ago. And the volume was called Islamophobia, Islamophilia. Right? And it was sort of uh, on that question. And, you know, there was a kind of like Arab and, and or Muslim sheikh, or sheikh, however you want to call it. Right? But sheikh, insofar as that was a joke. But, um, in, uh, not a very good one. Anyway, but, anyways. But you know how, like, you know, like right after, uh, soon after 9 11, in New York City, one of the most incredible things was how suddenly hookah bars were everywhere. It's, like, it's so interesting. I mean, I'm not sure co correlation or causation are the same thing in this or ever, but they might be. I mean, and that's so strange, you know. And it is very superficial, you know. Uh, there's a lot of superficial interest, and there's a lot of problematic, uh, uh, su even academic superficial interest too. For example, you know, during the Cold War. You've heard of the Cold War? Yes, okay. It's back on the pages of the New York Times today, incidentally. Um, the op-ed page of the Cold War. But anyway, so um, during the Cold War, there was a lot of interest in Russia and things Russian. And, and there was a lot of money, government money, that went into studying the Russian language and the Russian culture and things, sorts of things, right? And then the, the wall fell in Berlin and suddenly that money went, like, totally evaporated. And now a lot of that same money is going towards what they call, they actually, this is, a, a, I don't, I can't make this stuff up, okay? Uh, but they call these uh, national security languages. They're called national security languages. So they have these language institutes where they are teaching national security languages. And those na languages are, if I remember correctly, Arabic, Farsi, Farsi is Persian, right, from Iran, right? Um, Pashto, I think, which is a, a language that's in Afghanistan. Maybe some more of the Afghan languages. And Korean. Because in North Korea, it was considered the axis of evil. These are the axis of evil languages, right? 
So if once you have that kind of it's a so highly politicized view of knowledge acquisition, it has to be superficial by its by its nature. Because you have to get to actually really understand a language and a people and a culture, you have to know that people and culture. You can't just look at them as a national security threat. You're not approaching them as people then, you're approaching them as threat. And so it's a, it is a it is a problem. Don't you want to know what happened to yes Yasmin in her 10th uh, anniversary? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, so I've been tell telling Mustafa that I think there should be a sequel to the book because of the interesting things that happened, uh, you know, after the story was published. But yes, there was a high school reunion um, about maybe four four or five months ago that I really had no interest in attending. And I think, you know, as college students, you might understand why high school students, um, people who have graduated high school might not want to go back, you know. Thinking back, there were all the mean girls and, you know, all the people that, you know, were cruel to you. And um, my experience was generally pretty negative. Um, and, and so all those memories started rushing back and I really didn't want to go, but um, I was speaking to one of my colleagues and he said, you are class president, you should go back. I think you have an obligation, it's your duty as former <laughs> class president to go back. And so I thought about it and I said, well, are you going to go? And he said, yeah, I'm going to. And I said, okay, maybe if I have a friend to go with me, I'll go. Um, because I was scared to go back uh, because there was so much hatred at the time towards me for, ch for challenging the school. And a lot of people who were a part of my class um, had actually made some pretty uh, racist comments and, and I, I wasn't sure if they had the same feelings um, towards me so I, I wasn't too interested in, in going and then I started looking at old diaries just to remember what high school was like um, even though I had lost um, a bunch of my um, diaries that were more detailed I found one uh, diary that said something that I had totally forgotten but then I was really pissed off at, after I was done reading it um, one of my friends had gone up to a student and said, you know, my friend is running for president, will you vote for her? And he turned around and he said, oh, you mean her? Why would I vote for Osama bin Laden's daughter? And I was just, it, it was 10 years later, the high school reunion was 10 years later, and I was reading this and I was just so angry. So angry that I had to post a Facebook status about how angry I was. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think I quoted it and everything, but I was just so upset. And, and I was like, I don't want to go back to this. There's nothing for me to go back for. Um, but I ended up going, and, and people seemed not to hate me, so that was pretty um, surprising. Um, and then people actually uh, became aware of the book, and they expressed an interest in it. And First of all, a lot of people said, I didn't know you were going through all of that. And then some people said, I didn't know there was a book. Um, and so they were interested in, one, buying the book, and then two, um, hearing the story from me. And a lot of them actually apologized. And they said, you know, we're sorry that you had to go through that, and we didn't know um, that that's, you know, how much suffering um, you endured as a result of all of this. Um, what's interesting is that after... Um, after this story was published, before I went to law school, I ended up interning with, uh, interning and working for the first attorney that wanted to charge a lot of money that I couldn't afford. And then I ended up interning for the second attorney um, that ended up taking my case for free, and I worked with him for like two semesters. What was e probably the most interesting point was. Prior to this reunion, it's amazing what reunions will make you do because you end up writing to all these people saying sorries and thank yous. Um, I wrote to Andrew, who's uh, uh, the person who ran against me in the book, and I wrote him a long email and I said, you know, I just want you to know that that was a really difficult time for me and you didn't make it easy. You know, he was a real politician, so he was one of those people that would be like the mudslingers. Um, and the people that were around him were pretty cruel to me, and I said that was a really hurtful time, and um, you know, it's had a lasting effect to this day, but I don't have any hard feelings, and I just wanted to let you know that whatever was in the past is in the past, and you know, I think we should move forward. And he was actually very apologetic, and he said, you know, sometimes we do things that we don't mean, and I'm, I'm really sorry that you ended up experiencing what you experienced, 
um, but I'm genuinely sorry about that. And so he was actually running for a seat in the Senate. And I said, you know, I would actually be really interested in helping you, you know, run for office. And he's like, yes, you should volunteer. And so I just thought it was a, a kind of a really beautiful way for things to come around, like mending um, that relationship and then campaigning on his behalf. I, I, I just, you know, I, I, I like to joke and say he's just lucky I wasn't running against him in that race. <laughs> um, but it, I feel like the story really came full circle, I think, um, at that point, and who knows, you know, what else will come down the road, but um, those are the interesting developments that have happened since then. That's an interesting question. And so you mean for people who are non-Muslim to acknowledge, you know, the what are, what we might be observing and how the, they can accommodate that and vice versa? Yeah. Huh. Well, I don't know. That's really difficult because, you know, I've come to learn as an undergrad, grad student, and law student that alcohol is really central to any sort of gathering. It's, it's just one of the, the, the things that people do when they socialize. Um, uh, these days, how to make sure that there's respect. I mean, I, I think it depends on the person themselves. So there are some people, um, and it depends on, you know, what your interpretation is of faith and, you know, what you want to do and what you don't want to do. And so some people are open to the idea of maybe hanging out with their friends but not drinking. And so I've been to um, a number of uh, events where you know, people are drinking and they just stare at me and they just want to know why I'm not drinking. Um, but they absolutely respect the fact that I don't drink um, and they won't try to force me. And actually, I feel like they have a lot of respect for me. Um, and so there will be a lot of instances where alcohol is going to be involved. Um, I, don't, I don't partake in that because I don't uh, drink. But um, one, of the, one of the ways to kind of, you know, have a middle ground, I guess, um, is to find somewhat neutral-ish events. Like sometimes we'll go bowling, sometimes we'll do um, karaoke, but you can't really tell people you know, what to do. If they want to go have a drink, they can go have a drink. Um, but I, I think it's how you express, I guess, whatever it is your observations are, whatever friends you are um, surrounded by, that they'll probably be more than willing um, to ac accommodate you. But I think professors are the same way because when um, I was in uh, my graduate studies, we were having a um, uh, an end of semester party, and I didn't say anything. Everybody insisted that it had to be at the bar, and I wasn't really crazy about going to the bar because for me it's a little bit boring watching other people drink. Um, but I mean, I can have a Shirley Temple and whatnot, but bars aren't really like my my sort of scene. And it was actually the professor who reached out to me, and he said. Would you feel comfortable going to a bar or would you rather go somewhere else? And I said, to be honest, I would prefer if it was somewhere else. And so he just took care of it himself and sent an email. He said, you know, we're not going to go any place, Rowdy. We're just going to grab dinner at this place. And if you want to get drinks, you know, while you're there, you can do that. Um, so I, I think it depends on who you're surrounded by. So sometimes people are a little bit more conscious and they'll, um, they'll, they'll, they'll reach out to you. But if not, you can, you can always explain to them. I feel like the people who I've been surrounded by have been very receptive and they don't object to anything like that and they're willing to make accommodations. All right, well that brings us to the close of our evening tonight, but if we could give our presenters another hand. all for coming out tonight and on your way out again if you want to pick up some information from the Muslim Student Association there's some representatives back there have a great night